Thank you, David, and, and thank you for the organizers for this opportunity. And I'm kind of trying to refresh my memory on a lot of this stuff. So it's a good opportunity to uh, present the work of my colleagues and some of the, some of the additional work that has been done uh, in the group. What I want to do, uh, let's see. So the outline here, uh, just very quickly, we're going to go through antisense oligonucleotides mechanism, which for this group is going to be very high level, um, and then review uh, some of the PK systemic biodistribution, both for the GALNAC conjugates and the non-conjugates, uh, really to um, further, further define that and some of the data that underlies our understanding and the design of those molecules. And then I ask the question, what about the brain? And uh, we're doing a lot of work now in the CNS, and so I'll talk a little bit about what we're learning uh, early on in the distribution of oligos in the brain. This mechanism slide I think you've already seen today, but just to make the point that for oligonucleotides that are engaging with messenger RNA, of course you've got to be inside the cell. So distribution and cell uptake and delivery are, are incredibly important. Also incredibly important is the chemistry, and we've talked uh, quite a bit about that already in the early sessions. Uh, optimizing chemistry for different uh, um, modalities for antisense oligonucleotides. We show here kind of the uh, evolution of the chemistry. Uh, still today, the two prime methoxyethyl is, is a, a priority molecule for us. The Gen 2.5s are, are coming on, and I'm going to be speaking primarily about Gen 2 and 2.5 and then moving into the Galnex. So the PK is quite straightforward. I'm going to be focused primarily on distribution. So what I want you to really take home from this is that for these oligonucleotides, once injected, uh, they quite quickly become bound to plasma proteins. Albumin is uh, one of the largest carriers uh, of the oligonucleotide as it circulates. So they're protein bound, they're rapidly and extensively distributed, and systemically they're distributed to just about every tissue, but certainly not every cell actively. And, and that's where the chemistry comes in uh, to great importance. And finally, the trough levels that if you have a sensitive enough assay, you're able to um, actually monitor pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and target concentrations uh, in the body so that you can actually define doses and then track those in the clinic. So what we're showing here is the cross species, the pharmacokinetics uh, are, uh, are, are, are very similar. So from rat to man, pretty much one to one in terms of clearance. And looking on the left hand side, you're, you're looking at monkey versus man. Uh, versus just an IV and a sub-Q administration, essentially superimposable. So when we talk about biodistribution, one of the, one of the key methods that we use is autoradiography, and so we use uh, certain techniques for stabilized isotopes on the molecules, and this is just one of the colored views of that, which we've used quite extensively. But what you see, both on the left-hand side following sub-Q administration, 24 hours post snapshot, on the right-hand side is IV administration, the same 24-hour snapshot, essentially the same distribution with uh, a lot of uh, drug being located in the liver and in the kidney. And you can see that on the left-hand side, the purple, which is kind of a low concentration, approximately 10 to 100 fold less than what you see in the liver, is quite broad and is primarily associated with muscle and visceral tissue. And then you have uh, kind of a moderate level of distribution to the intestines and the bone and the bone marrow, and then the high concentrations that you see in the liver and the kidney, with the highest concentrations uh, in the kidney cortex for these phosphorothioates. So speaking about the trough levels, uh, here we're looking at, in blue, plasma concentrations, in pink, liver concentrations over time uh, in an animal model, in this case in monkeys. And what you can see is that the clearance uh, from plasma, whether you look at a more rapidly uh, clearing molecule on the left 
a slower, molecule, slower clearing molecule on the right. Plasma can track that, and we can use plasma to uh, further uh, identify the optimal regimens to be given and uh, to attain those concentrations that we want to attain uh, in the target uh, compartment. And here we're just looking at um, concentration versus activity. And the, the point I wanted to bring out here is that the mouse, and in fact the transgenic mouse, has become pretty much our working model as we work towards uh, optimal human candidates. And, the, and that, in part, is because the concentration that you achieve, while clearance is quite different in a mouse and a man, the concentrations that you're able to achieve in the target tissue uh, is nearly one-to-one -one between a mouse and man. Uh, pretty remarkable. In fact, this has been shown in, in multiple compounds, and now today we have, this is just an example of four compounds where we can measure the target protein in plasma over time. And once again, the, um, the doses that achieve these kinds of uh, reductions for the unconjugated uh, oligonucleotides are generally between 50 milligrams and uh, 300 milligrams per week. So one of the important things um, beyond just looking at broad tissue distribution is really understanding sub-organ sub or cellular uh, distribution. And that's what this uh, particular nomogram on the left and the uh, histogram on the right shows you. And for the unconjugated ASOs, phosphorothyroids, about tenfold more drug will end up in endothelial and kupfer cells, in other words, the non-parenchymal compartment in the liver versus the hepatocytes, so the parenchymal compartment. Now, the hepatocytes are generally the largest mass in the liver. So overall, you've got about the same amount or just a little bit less in the hepatocyte compartment. But what you can see in the nomogram is that you saturate the non-parenchymal compartment while you get a really nice dose-dependent increase in distribution to hepatocytes. However, it's not optimal. You've got a lot of your drug that goes to the liver going to the wrong cell type if your target is the hepatocytes. And so we uh, have known for years about the GALNAC and, and what may be done there. It wasn't quite um, well understood how well it might work for antisense oligonucleotides. But essentially what is shown here is the chemistry, and you've seen quite a bit of this, so I'm not going to go through this in detail. But in essence, uh, what you see is a redistribution to the hepatocytes actually results in a tremendous increase in potency for these molecules. So the same molecule with a conjugate approximately 30-fold more potent in man. So some of the work that was done uh, in the lab was really to look at how did this distribution within the liver, uh, how was it altered with the conjugate. And if you look on the bottom row, the C and D graphics, uh, what you can see is that with, with the conjugate, essentially 90, 95% of the drug is now going to the hepatocyte within the liver not really changing the overall concentrations in the liver, but now you're changing the concentration subcellularly uh, significantly. And what that results in, well, quite a few uh, number of uh, publications, if anyone might be interested in going into more detail, ultimately it, it increases the, the, uh, the potency. But this little chart kind of uh, gives you a, an idea of what is happening with the parent compound versus the conjugated compound. With 95% of your drug distributing now to the hepatocytes, don't know if we've been able to do that, on the right-hand side, you've got 20 milligram per week GALNAC, and based on uh, the clinical work that we've done, subcellular in the monkeys, what you're, what you're generally able to achieve with 20 milligrams versus 300 unconjugated is the same or a little bit better distribution to the hepatocytes in terms of concentration, number of molecules in that cell. A greatly reduced amount of the oligonucleotide in the non-parenchyma, and then ultimately much reduced 
uh, plasma concentrations, so your CMAX AUC and your safety margins are tremendously increased with a 40 to greater than 100-fold reduction in exposure in the plasma as well as to the full uh, liver as well as to the kidney. So that results in not only improved potency, but a significant improvement in safety margin. This is just some of the uh, data from the first in human with the first conjugate uh, showing that with very low doses down to 10 milligrams weekly, you can achieve greater than 50% uh, reduction. And at the 40 milligram weekly, you're essentially maximizing your, your reduction uh, of this particular target uh, in plasma by essentially 95%. So what about the brain? Um, as I finish up the last four minutes here. Um, if you look at the top slide, you're looking at, uh, an un in both cases, unconjugated molecule. The top slide, you're looking at uh, distribution broadly, systemically following sub-Q, but nothing in the brain. So these drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier. But if you introduce these drugs intrathecally, which is the lower panel, and unfortunately not in color, but if you look at the black versus, and the gray versus the white, that's where the drug is. And you can see that the distribution throughout the CNS is quite high. Uh, and of course, some of this drug also spills out. And you'll see some of the uh, oligonucleotide and some of the autoradiography uh, in the liver. And so you do, do still see some systemic it, uh, it, uh, distribution. But the doses that are required for the central nervous system are much, much lower than what are, are normally given for activity in the, in the uh, broader systemic uh, tissues. So this is just um, a snapshot of some of the histo work that we're doing to better understand and map uh, distribution not only to the regions of the brain and the spinal cord, but also the cell types. And you can see really nice distribution uh, to neurons in the lower panel uh, of the lumbar spine, in the striatum, and even in the, in the cortex uh, as following uh, basically 24 hours post uh, of a single injection into the intrathecal space. So the cerebral spinal fluid results in nice distribution throughout the CNS. We, we did have a few questions to ask in this regard, and little is known about the kinetics of how fast the oligonucleotide moves to the various regions of the brain. And so we worked together with our uh, colleagues at Biogen to come up with a, an, an approach to uh, begin to look at this. And some of our early work is being done in the rat, once again, intrathecal administration, now with a, uh, a ligand on the oligonucleotide uh, that allows us then to track through SPECT um, CT uh, analysis in a live animal, the distribution over time of the oligonucleotide in the brain. And this is kind of what it looks like. So you get kind of a 3D uh, picture at different times. The zero hour is actually about uh, 30 seconds to a minute after injection. And then you have over the first hour distribution further and further into the brain by one hour you essentially have drug associated with tissues throughout, and by six to 24 hours, we found that most of the drug was now moving intracellularly in all of these regions, able to modulate messenger RNA. So, that just gives you a high level, as I will summarize, Gen 2 and 2.5 antisense molecules demonstrate similar PK. One of the things I didn't say was because of the greater affinity of the 2.5 molecule, you saw low concentrations being distributed to the muscle. That doesn't change, but you actually begin to see now messenger RNA engagement and antisense activity in muscle. And also, because the muscle is really a nice model for tumor, distribution also in, in tumors. And then we have the Galnac conjugation, which can increase the uptake to specific cell types and the Leica technology that continues to evolve with new conjugates for better distribution to muscle, better distribution to tumors, and so forth. And finally, ASOs distribute to most of the CNS after 
uh, IT injection into the cerebral spinal fluid, and we're learning uh, a lot from that, and hopefully we'll be coming out with a, uh, with a paper very soon that, that maps the entire brain and gives a little bit more granularity to which cell types, how fast, and how robustly they work uh, throughout the brain. So I'll finish with my acknowledgments to all of the talented scientists that make this happen, as well as our uh, colleagues at uh, Biogen, in vitro, and Axia. Thank you very much. Thank you.